You know what? It's time we talk about Saw. After being a yearly Halloween installment for most of the 2000s, time caught up with it and we witnessed a decline in popularity. But as a franchise that blew up and basically started its own subgenre, I think it's time for us to dig in and give this franchise the black sheep treatment. Starting with Saw 3D, aka the final chapter. Now the original Saw came out in 2004. And if you had any lingering hope of your youth, it's time to put that baby to bed. Because yeah, just like me, you are old. After so many years, I would assume that the Saw franchise would go the agreed upon route and end up in space. Like Jason X, Critters 4, Hellraiser Bloodline, and even Leprechaun 4 all took their gore to the final frontier. Side note, I love each of these entries for their own reason, but Saw isn't quite there yet. And finally, there's a gimmick that can be wildly entertaining, or it can be a spectacular failure. That is to push it into the third dimension. Now this has come in waves of popularity, with the two biggest being the 80s and the resurgence in the mid 2000s. Saw 3D is also known as Saw the Final Chapter. And the fact that this movie has two different titles should come as no surprise to those who have seen it because it feels like two vastly different movies within the Saw franchise. It is also the reason why production of future films in the franchise slowed way down after this one. Why all the hate though? Well, we're to tell you to relax a bit and enjoy, because Saw the Final Chapter is a better time than you've been led to believe. Saw 7, which is what we're going to be calling it from here on out, starts off with one hell of a callback, showing us Wesley himself. You warthog-faced buffoon reprising his role as Dr. Gordon. It turns out that after his horrific ordeal in the first film, he actually lived. I mean, he's a doctor after all, and did pass Jigsaw's test, which the series has shown us will buy you a ticket to living again. Unfortunately, this great idea turns out to be slightly more than a cameo, and one of the best aspects of the movie gets wasted a bit. Five years have passed, and we are shown a very public game between two bros and the girl they think loves only them. The trap is designed to leave only one of the men and the girl alive. But after a struggle, the two men work together to kill the cheating girlfriend and walk away intact. This very public execution is followed by one of our two main plot points. Jill, the wife of Jigsaw, decides after watching Mark Hoffman survive her trap. Game over. No! I will convict! it's finally time to turn him in into internal affairs. This is where the movie seems to branch into two completely different stories. You have Jill hiding out from Hoffman while the cops try and protect her and find him, while the second plot concerns Bobby, who is on a book tour following his career change as a self-help guide, specializing in those that have survived any of the lovely tests set by Jigsaw. What's he talking about? Now this is another solid idea from the film. I mean, how many people have died or been maimed from these kill chambers? There would absolutely be the need for support groups for the survivors or family of the victims. Anyway, Bobby is kidnapped and wakes up in an abandoned hospital, dangling in a cage above a bed of spikes. Ah, Jigsaw. He is told he has an hour to save his wife, who is chained to some sort of mechanism in the floor. Now the movie switches back and forth between these two storylines with Hoffman as the link. He is the one that kidnaps Bobby and he is the one that is after Jill, hoping to get her before he is caught for his crimes. We get another seemingly arbitrary test scene with a bunch of white supremacists stuck in a various death devices around a junkyard. After the typical Billy the Puppet message, <laughs> yeah, that uh, creepy ass puppet is named Billy. The whole racist squad is absolutely eviscerated by their respective traps. Now I, I say arbitrary because when you watch this scene, these characters don't have anything to do with anyone else in the story. They are introduced here and they die here. Hell, most of them don't even get names. It's only later that we find out that they are merely a means to an end. Now, here's where I want to take a little sidestep and give my appreciation of Mark Hoffman, the true villain of the Saw franchise. 
No, 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 just stick with me. John Kramer is certainly the architect of everything that happens. You know, he created the first traps. He grooms those to follow in his footsteps and is certainly misguided in his attempts to make people reevaluate their lives. <laughs> but damn, Hoffman is just a stone cold psychopath. He kills innocent people, rigs traps, and later in this movie, takes out more cops than Maniac Cop and the Terminator combined. He should be celebrated up there with the best of the slasher killer icons. It turns out that the skinhead trial was just a way for Hoffman to double back and get taken to the police station morgue to get Jill from the inside. While this is going on to, you know, pad the main story, we float back to Bobby on his way to try and save his wife. He has to get through rooms containing his publicist. As usual with, you know, Saw films, they are stuck in these elaborate traps that are timed to the task for Bobby to perform. Yeah, he lied about being in one of Jigsaw's traps and turned it into a money-making career, but he is genuinely trying to help the real victims of the cruel mastermind. He is self-serving, but uh, he is doing a good deed. He also genuinely tries to save his entourage from these traps, even when the solution involves harming himself. A lot of times in these movies, the mazes are filled with tons of unlikable characters, partly because they are tropes written that way and, you know, partly because... <laughs> Yeah, damn, it's fun to watch them pay for being assholes. One by one, his friends and colleagues are killed in incredibly brutal ways as he forces his way through the abandoned hospital. These sections are what brought you here and why it's still worth watching. At this point in the series, the Saw films were filling a very specific need. Brutal and unique kills and a hilariously convoluted plot. Between the love triangle at the beginning, the white supremacist group, and you know, spoiler alert, Chester and his friends don't make it. The people close to Bobby, they all die in awful ways. Flesh tears, bodies are pulled apart, eyes are gouged. This, this is what you come to a Saw film for. Hoffman manages to Metal Gear Solid his way into the police station and kill his way to Jill. When he finally does get to her, he uses the reverse bear trap headgear that this series has become famous for. And you know, it's, it's a really nice touch since this was supposed to be the last film. While we never get back to Bobby's story to see if he escapes or not, Hoffman burns all the evidence and flees, believing he has escaped capture. When he gets to his car though, it's a different story. He is ambushed and knocked out by another staple of the series, the pig costumed assailant. Now, there are multiple people taking him down, but the ringleader, turns out to be none other than Dr. Gordon. What the fuck? Now, you, you probably aren't shocked that it's him between the dirty, sinister looks and the sarcastic clapping he gives, as well as it being sort of a Chekhov's actor situation going on. If an actor of his importance shows up, then he has to have an important reason. He locks Hoffman in the very room he was locked in in the very first movie. The difference here is that there's no choice to remove a limb. Gordon throws the saw blade towards the camera in one of the most goofy 3D shots. Before proclaiming that the game is over. Now listen, it is what it is. It is very much a saw movie through and through, but it has the lowest audience and critical response and it wasn't a success for the studio. I think it was just too many missed opportunities to be great and not enough cohesion of plot to really be that memorable. And for that, I can't argue. But by part seven, you should know what you're getting into. Uh, yeah, you're not changing the game here. He came in this for a goofy plot, some cool kills, and maybe a stupid 3D shot, like a saw being thrown at the screen. <laughs> Come on. Now I ask you, do you watch every film in a horror series because they're top notch? No. You ain't watching Jason Goes to Hell, Texas Chainsaw Massacre of the Next Generation, Halloween 5, or Saw 7, because they are great cinema. You watch them because they are escapism at their finest, with comfort foods like plot and characters. You watch them because horror films need to be seen, discussed, and if you could find it in your cold, bitter heart, enjoyed. Yeah, this isn't for everyone, but uh, it doesn't mean it's for no one. Let Saw 7, which is not the final chapter, and what comes to any long-going horror series, give every film a chance. Love it or hate it. I'd rather it exist than not. Relax, folks, and just let it be. Let it be. Hey, thanks for watching our show. 
please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support. Thank <laughs> you.